Hello, and welcome to episode 30 of the Sci-Fi Podcast. From Bloomington, Indiana, I'm Nick Zoutra. Today on the podcast, I am very pleased to welcome Indiana University's very own Dr. Elizabeth Lloyd. Elizabeth, or Lisa as she's known to us, currently holds the Arnold and Maxine Tannis Chair of History and Philosophy of Science, and is also Professor of Biology, Adjunct Professor of Philosophy here at Indiana, Affiliated Faculty Scholar at the Kinsey Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction, and Adjunct Faculty at the Center for Integrative Study of Animal Behavior. Lisa is first and foremost a philosopher of science with important work in evolutionary biology, scientific objectivity, and feminist epistemology and philosophy of science. Her 2005 book, The Case of the Female Orgasm, was widely discussed in the scholarly and popular press, including Isis, Nature, and the New York Times. The book criticizes what is portrayed as anti-scientific biases infecting the many proposed adaptive explanations of the female orgasm. Lisa argues that the available evidence, such as from sexology studies, is actually far more supportive of a neutral byproduct explanation put forward by Donald Simmons, under which female orgasm is the result of orgasm developing as a species trait due to its critical role in males for procreation, akin to explanations for why nipples, which are required for nursing in females, are also present in males. The book received so much attention that it was lampooned on an episode of Saturday Night Live because its title sounds like a racy version of a Hardy Boys novel. Uh, Lisa had been working on the subject for two years when a discussion with Stephen Jay Gould in 1986 led to her providing the basis for his 1987 essay in Natural History titled Freudian Slip, which was reprinted in 1992 as Male Nipples and Clitoral Ripples. Uh, Most recently, Lisa has turned her attention toward the philosophy of climate science, and in particular, issues concerning confirmation and robustness in climate models. Thus, without further ado, let's bring in Lisa. Dr. Elizabeth Lloyd, welcome to the Sci-Fi Podcast. How are you this morning? I'm very good. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, For our listeners who don't know, Elizabeth Lloyd is... uh, one of my uh, dissertation advisors here at Indiana University. Um, how uh, how long have you been teaching at Indiana, uh, Lisa? Oh gosh, well it's almost twenty years. It's a, sh- a year shy of twenty years um, since I came from Berkeley. Wow, wow. Uh, well, I'm very excited to hear. Uh, have you enjoyed your time at Bloomington thus far? Oh yes, very much. Great, great. Um, okay, well. Before we uh, before we launch into that and hear more about Bloomington, let's go ahead and uh, let's get start back at the beginning. I, I'm really curious to hear about your origin story. So, uh, tell me, Lisa, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Summit, New Jersey. It's uh, um, now only Bob's Place in Bloomington, but when I was growing up, it was an executive bedroom community for New York executives and people who worked at. Bell- uh, that's the um, AT&T Brain Trust Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And so, um, well, anyway, it was a very rich town. I thought we were lower middle class because, um, like, we went skiing in New York, but my friends went skiing in Switzerland, and I only went horseback riding <laughs> once a week instead of every day. I, I wow. thought we were lower middle class. But we lived in a five-story Queen Anne Victorian mansion with a ta- one of those pointed towers. Um, but everybody else's yard was bigger than I, so ours, so I thought we were poorer than average. <laughs> that is, we, yeah. So there was this kind of perceived to, sense of... Uh, <laughs> um, it, it goes to show you that everything is relative, really. But <laughs> yeah, we, we lived we live just a stone throw from New York City is the important thing. And we, my mom would always take us to the art and natural history museums on a regular basis. And she liked to take the children on expeditions. So we went all over and always had a great time at these museums. 
Great, great. And what uh, what did your parents do growing up? What were what were they up to? Um, well, my my father was a mathematician in the pure math department at Bell Labs, um, where he formulated not only Lloyd's theory theorem but also Lloyd's algorithm, which turned out I just accidentally discovered very recently mm. is central to cutting edge climate model models today. Um, and the uh, cutting edge climate models are based on Lloyd's algorithm, which is a fundamental theorem in information oh. theory that is is the basis of like the encryption on your credit card when you use it. Um, so it's a it's a fundamental theorem in information theory. You can you can look it up and see what it's used for. It's called Lloyd's algorithm. Yeah, but, yeah, I see um, it right here. It, yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't know that until after he died, um, because he was so it, two things. He was extremely modest man, mm-hmm. and um, he was also schizophrenic for much of his life, um, and especially when I was growing up, um, until he found the proper treatment when I was about thirteen, which turned out to be vitamins and minerals. He was suffering from an acute um, deficiencies because of. Uh, a blood disorder, which we inherited, actually. Oh, wow. Um, and, um, but, well, for example, I didn't know until I went to grad school at Princeton um, that w- when he, we were moving me into Princeton, mm-hmm. he said, oh, I lived I lived over there when I went to, when I lived in Princeton. I said, Daddy, you never lived in Princeton. He said, yes, I did. I was at the Institute for Advanced Study with Einstein and Oppenheimer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? Um, and it turns out they only had twelve people there in the there in that year in mm-hmm. 1950, and so it was a very intimate institute. And um, he um, had stories about Oppenheimer being raided by the FBI and the FBI wow. coming in the middle of the night and taking boxes out of Oppenheimer's office and putting them into the trunk of their cars, which he witnessed. And I mean, just amazing stuff. But so that he had a very interesting life. Um, uh, But he was also quite sick. And uh, my mother was also bipolar. So we were, we were basically raised by wolves, but yeah. um, Yeah. Uh, Was there like an uh, awareness at the time or was this kind of like after the fact uh, kind of thinking back, Oh, you know, well, people around us knew that we were raised by wolves, and so sure. they cut us a lot of slack. Um, uh, so, so my pa- my parents were treated differently from mm. other people. Um, there was awareness at the time that they that they were very sick. Sure, sure. Um, and um, but my environment, you know, this all helped me much later on when because when my environment was very difficult, for example, in grad school and when I was first starting out in the profession, it was very yeah. difficult. But I could cope because I had grown up in these very adverse circumstances. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it gave me a lot of coping skills, um, I think, and a certain toughness that you get um, from being in that kind of environment. Yeah, um, and I, I, I was very lucky and privileged when I was growing up. My, my parents bought me the most beautiful musical instruments to play. I was a musician and almost went into um, music, actually, as an oh. oboist. Oh, what did you, uh, uh, what did you like to play? Um, well, I, I studied piano all my life, but since I was four and a half, but um, I, I wasn't very good at it. Um, but I, what I was good at was the oboe, and I was a semi-professional mm-hmm. oboist when I was a teenager. I, I did um, pick up money um, playing in um, a chamber music oh, orchestras wow. um, and stuff like that when I was a teenager. And I was being groomed to go to Juilliard and Juilliard Summer School when I, when I just quit. I, I just decided I didn't want to be a musician because I thought I would be bored. Um, yeah, how, being, so being, mm-hmm. being a musician. How did it, how did you come to that realization? I mean, it sounds like you knew right away, or was there some experience playing, rehearsing, etc.? Well, I was in five or six different groups at the same time, right? I mean, I was a very serious 
musician when I was a teenager. I didn't do anything else. I didn't do school. I mean, I was mm. I was at school. But I I never did my homework. In other words, <laughs> I, I didn't. Yeah. I I didn't ever do any work at home. My home was so chaotic that I didn't ever do anything at home except practice my instruments. Sure. And so. And so I taught myself the guitar, I taught myself the banjo and the flute, and I played the oboe, I played the piano. And so I playing the instruments was what I did. And um and I and I was competing, I was playing, um, I was doing music a lot. And I just realized there wasn't enough brain food, basically. Mm. I I wanted to be a biologist. So yeah, did uh, was, uh, so you wanted to be a biologist. Was this, uh, was there a particular incident or uh, event or, um, you know, did you have some interest in biology and the sciences growing up? Well, I was interested in animals ever since I was very, very small. Ever since I was two, mm. I was interested in animals and any animals doing anything. I collected lizards. I caught lizards and toads and snakes and, uh, I mean, I was just interested in, in, I was interested in evolution ever since I discovered it um, at age six because we got the Time Life series of picture books uh, mm-hmm. on science and um, on the different, uh, and it's a Time Life series on science. And and um, they had a book on evolution that came when I was six. And, um, and I devoured that. I loved that. I became an evolutionist when I was six. And I read that book again and again until it, the back broke off of it. Um, and I, I, that was my favorite book in the whole series. I just uh, would take it up to my room and, and study it. And so I was fascinated by evolution. I, I also loved the, looking at the book on mammals and reptiles as well as mm. birds. I was just fascinated by animals. I wanted to be a vet, actually. Okay, until yeah, about yeah. Six until about sixth grade, I learned there was a profession of marine biologist from watching Jacques Cousteau. Mm. And that's when I changed and wanted to be a marine biologist instead of a vet. And I wanted to get a PhD. Um, and, and so I changed over from uh, wanting, to get, wanting to get a PhD in marine biology. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what I wanted um, when I first went to undergraduate school. Um, but when I but when I went to undergraduate school first at Queen's University in Ontario, mm-hmm. um, I was visiting a guidance counselor before classes started, and of course I had enrolled in Biology 101 so I could get started on my biology career. And he disenrolled me from Biology 101, the, the class I was most looking forward to. Oh. And he said it was too hard for me, that girls were better off as geography majors, oh. and that I would enjoy the Geography 110 class that he enrolled me in instead of the biology class. Oh, my God. Um, these were year-long courses, not semester courses. So I was stuck with his decision for my entire freshman year. Um, I dropped out of college after that year. I was so unmotivated and so discouraged. And um, I went to live on an intentional community, a, a hippie commune. Really? And in fact, that still, yeah, and it's still thriving, in fact. There was just an article about it in the Kansas City Star. It's called East Wind, and it's a very successful commune. How was, yeah. Anyway. So this is a very interesting time, I, I, I must ask. <laughs> How was the time at, the, at East Wind? Oh, it's fabulous. I, I just, you know, it's fantastic. You can just, I mean, you're 19 years old. All you want to do is, you know, have sex. So, um, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. You're just hanging out and spending time with people. And <laughs> yeah. Having, having, having a lot of sex and having fun. I mean, it yeah, was great. Of course. Of course. Um, and, but after a while, I, 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 I and my woman friends had horrible experiences with the gynecologist down in Arkansas in the Ozarks where the commune was. So when I went back to school at the University of Colorado at Boulder, I wanted to be a doctor now. Mm. And so my second undergraduate experience, though, was, was really a dream. Yeah, so um, after leaving Queens and, and experiencing some, some fun times at 19 at Eastwind, what, uh, what was next? Well, I, I went back to college when I was 20, mm-hmm. and um, I was basically... 
I, as a biology and pre-med, as a biology major and pre-med, what I wanted to do, and they, this time they let me take biology. Mm-hmm. And um, I was picked up by the scruff of the neck by a philosophy professor um, named Gary Stahl. And he snuck up on me because, you know, I was taking an honors class on human nature and um, and I really loved the course. And I didn't know he was a philosopher. I had enrolled in a philosophy class at Queen's University, which I dropped after about four classes because all we did was talk about what, how we knew the table was there. And <laughs> I... I had been raised in a scientific family. Everything about... Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, hmm. my mother was a mathematician as well. Um, I was, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't follow also, up. Yeah. No, my mother was a mathematician as well. She was a mathematician at Bell Labs, and that's where they met. They were both mathematicians at Bell Labs. Hmm. And they met at the Go Club. So they were playing the Chinese game. Oh, the game. Go, oh okay. There was this, Go, right? Okay. And that's where they met was at the at the hanging game out of playing go. go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's where they met. So fig, go figure, right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> but my mother was fired from her job as a mathematician at Bell Labs when she got pregnant with my older brother, oh. and so she lost her career that way, and became a very unsatisfied housewife, among yeah, other uh, things. Yeah. So anyway, uh, she finally did go back to work uh, at the labs um, when my younger brother was in high school after she had been a housewife all those years, but um, and a mother. Um, but anyway, uh, so anyway, very tall. So I had taken a philosophy class and um, was very dissatisfied with the philosophy class and thought philosophy was bullshit because. I'd been raised in a scientific household where you were interested in evidence and reasoning and inference mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And then all we talked about was how we knew the table was there. And so I thought philosophy was bullshit. And then there was this wonderful book on human nature. And it felt that it's all who picked me up by the back of the neck and then said, you know, you want to do an independent study with me? And I said, yes, I'd love to. Can we do it on human nature some more? And biology. And he supervised me. He got me to write my own in structured major. Um, so because I could, I was pre-med, but I mm. w- wanted to do a double major in political theory. Mm. And he said, look, you can write your own major. So I ended up writing my own major called science and political theory, mm-hmm. um, which is how I graduated um, in with my own structured oh, wow. major in science and political theory. And he's the one who told me about history and philosophy of science because I'd never heard of it and I didn't take any courses in it. Um, I didn't know there was such a field. Mm. but. He told me to apply for the National Science Foundation Graduate Fellowship, and I read about that, and I decided to apply for it, even though I had never heard of the field. Huh. And and so I kind of studied up on it and read some Kuhn and Feyerabend, and I was captivated by the Kuhn and Feyerabend and said, this is what I want to do. So I wrote up an application for the NSF because he wanted me to apply for it. And that's what I decided when I decided, well, I, I want to go to graduate school in this field on my way to medical school. I would just do it for a couple of years before I go to med school. Sure. Sure. Um, so, so if you can remember, just uh, before you get into this next part, when, when you talk about, uh, you know, studying up and having red coon and fire auburn and being captivated, uh, do you recall, like, you know, what were some of those initial insights or uh, positions that really got you excited? Well, I was interested in um, Far Robin's discussion of scientific method, um, mm-hmm. that he didn't think there was a formula for scientific method, mm-hmm. that, um, that there was not an algorithmic formula for scientific reasoning, which struck me as a, a reasonable thing to say. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I thought that was a totally reasonable thing to say. Also, I liked what Kuhn had to say about paradigm change because I had been studying um, uh, psychology and there was a lot of resistance at the time to um, Buddhist and Eastern meditation practices in psychology, even though Buddhist and Eastern meditation practices had been shown on the evidence Hmm. to reduce stress. I mean, nowadays, it's very commonly understood that they reduce stress, but in 1979 and 1980, it was taken to be a ridiculous hypothesis. Hmm. And I thought that that was a bad attitude. And so I saw that as a paradigm challenge to Western psychology, that Eastern psychology was a paradigm shift for Western psychology. So I wrote an honors thesis on that subject using Kuhn as my basis. Um, Under under the supervision of my mentor, who was not a philosopher of science and didn't study Eastern philosophy or psychology or Western psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, But just let give me a free reign. So I actually did write a senior thesis using Kuhn, as many undergraduates do. Sure, sure. Um, okay, and so you know, with the plan of eventually still going to medical school, and I must say, so so you were, was it the uh, you had mentioned something about you know an unfortunate experience um, back while at the uh, you know at at Eastwind um, at some other fellows. What were some of your motivations for thinking of wanting to go to medical school? Well, I, I just wanted to do some good in the world. I, yeah. I wanted to help people. I wanted to help people. I wanted to help women have a better experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ultimately, ultimately, that that turned out to be something I could do with my book, and with my later research on female orgasm, it turned out to be I could help women. Yep. Um, and so um, I did manage to eventually get around to helping women. Um, so I'm, I was really excited about being able to do that. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm very excited to hear more about the book. Um, what, uh, so what was next after undergraduate? Um, well, I applied to, my mentor gave me a list of schools that I should apply to, and I dutifully did that, thinking that I couldn't get anywhere, but I got in everywhere. And I went to Princeton because it was the number one department, and I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I should do this right. And um, I went to grad school, and I found out that I had to pay for a woman who thought on her own. Um, I was one of two women in the entire graduate program at all at all years, and the other woman was also a first year. They got rid of all the upper class women. So I was always the only woman in the room at grad school. What do you, when you and, when you say you got you got rid of the women, what does that mean? Um, they discouraged all the upper class women. Um, huh. All the upper class women had been discouraged from continuing on in the profession. Um, much in the way I'll I'll tell you a story that shows you what I mean. Sure, sure. Um. So my first year, I wrote a paper for my Darwin seminar, arguing that Darwin's theory was um, properly expressed in terms of model outlines and shouldn't be understood the way it was being understood by philosophers in terms of axioms and laws. Um, and um, I showed my paper to Boss von Frossen, and he told me it was publishable, mm-hmm. but he also suggested that I might might be interested in taking a look at his new book, which was The Scientific Image. And I read the book, and I was thrilled that he defended there a model view. And I thought, fantastic. It's called The Semantic View of Theories. Mm -hmm. And I thought, fantastic. I can adopt his view and put my model's outline view in terms of his view, and it'll be legitimated, right? Sure. Um, And um, so I, I... I, I did that. I, I framed my model's paper in terms of his view, and I sent it off to philosophy of science, and it was accepted for publication. And um, and then I wrote another paper that was also accepted for publication in my second year. Um, so I had a couple of papers in philosophy of science, and 
this was at a time when it was extremely unusual for for graduate students to publish at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I when I graduated, it came time to go on the job market. Something funny happened. Um, there were thirteen students on the market, and Princeton at the time ranked their students. So the way that worked was the the um, the, the the placement committee um, ranked. Students recommended them for specific jobs, and their recommendations were taken very seriously by the depart the departments who were hiring. Mm-hmm. So you could apply for a job that you weren't recommended for, but nobody would at the other end would take your application very seriously if things went as planned, right? Sure. So none of the other job candidates that year had a single publication, but I still was ranked 13 out of 13, the lowest student. And, I, and also, I had been on academic probation my entire time at Princeton, despite having two papers in the top journal. Um, and I got recommended for community college and small unknown colleges and very few other jobs. Wow. Um, no, no major job. So I actually learned decades later why this happened through von Franzen. Um He received a teaching award many years later, and Paul Benazraf, who had been the placement chair at the time and the chair of the department, um, so he was he was giving von Frossen the award in front of the audience, and he said von Frossen had a gift for recognizing student talent, for example, when he mentored this graduate student who everybody else in the department thought was hopeless, but who turned out to be a major influence in the profession. And von Frossen went up afterwards and asked, Benazraf about that reference to me, why they hadn't recognized my talent when I had two papers in the top journal in the field. Mm-hmm. And Benazraf said to Von Frosten simply, we thought you wrote those papers. Wow. So, you see, it was impossible for me to get credit for my own work. Couldn't do anything. <laughs> wow. Wow. And for the faculty to put the two things together, me, Lisa Lloyd, the woman, and my own original work, it was impossible for me to get credit for my own work. So, so what can you say? I don't know. Uh, When, yeah. That's such a, that's such a, that's such a terrible position. And the, Ugh, I don't know. Yeah. So so anyway, I I nevertheless ended up getting a good job because um I don't well, I don't know exactly why actually. Von Frosten certainly helped. Um back then if you got an interview at the big APA jobs convention, mm-hmm. um at the convention and not before, they gave you a little slip with a room number and school on it in your little file folder in the placement center, right? Mm-hmm. And and Paul Benazraf, who, by the way, petted and touched me every single day during my graduate school career when I went in to get my mail, he would lurk in the lounge where the mailboxes were and pounced and moved in wherever, whenever I would enter the room and touch my arm, my shoulders, my breast. And Wait, what was this? Was seven years. <laughs> well, he did it. He started when I was first year and he continued until my last year. Um, this was several years before the Supreme Court ruled on sexual harassment in the workplace. So what he was doing had not even been advertised as being illegal yet. It was just it was just an extra price I had to pay oh, that the men did not have to pay in order to get my Ph.D. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a really, really, so, I mean, in reflecting on graduate school, I mean, yeah, you had mentioned that, you know, a tough, you know, family life and, you know, had made you resilient, but uh, what, you know, the, the kinds of things that you have to put up with is just, uh, I'm sure it's not, it's not, um, it's not unheard of, but it's just, uh, it's, I don't know. How, how do you, how did you think about it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, just, uh, it, it's just, uh, well, I'll tell you the rest of the story. So okay. I, I, I found a little clip with the University of California, San Diego job on it. And, and we had to show it to the chair of placement, who was also the chair of the department. And this is the same Paul Benazraf, who 
who was my har- harasser. Mm-hmm. And um, um, I, sh- I had to show him the little slip from UC San Diego. And he said, my little invitation from UC San Diego must be a mistake that they didn't mean to put it in my folder. Um, now, the fact was that he had recommended someone else up the food chain for that job, a, a man, but I had applied anyway, even without the department's recommendation, right? So we had to call and check that they really did want to interview me before I could go up and get interviewed for the job. I mean, talk about a psych out, right? Um, God, jeez. So, so despite all this, I made the short list, and I got what turned into a one-year job. They they had turned the job I applied for, which was a tenure track job, into the Churchlands hire. So I had to apply for the permanent opening the year after that. And when I was there, I watched the parade of competitors come to the department and apply for the job that I also applied for. Sure. But I got the tenure track job in the end, though I, I have to say it was hard won, right? Yeah. And yeah. yet I still, I yet I still heard people say throughout my career that I had an unfair advantage because I was a woman. Unfair advantage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um. Yeah, I, I hear that all the time. I hear that all the time. Sure. No. Yeah. 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 So, no. I don't. I don't doubt that. It just. Yeah. Can't really win either so, way. No. So there you have it. But wow. that's how I got my. That's but, how I got my job. Okay. So. And so yeah. So what? Uh, so your first job was at Berkeley. Is that correct? My first job was at UC San Diego. Or San Diego, then, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and then four years later, I got the job at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, there were three people on the shortlist. The other two people were my classmates at Princeton. Oh. And I got the job. Von Frosten was pretty happy about that, I have to say. Yeah, so it so- it sounds like you had a pretty uh I mean, how would you describe your, you know, your advising and relationship with ba- Von Frossen? Oh, you can't imagine a better advisor than Von Frossen. I I mean, there's one there's one thing I, I do differently than he does as an advisor, which is that I give my students a lot of praise. He doesn't believe in doing that because he thinks it will have an influence on them, an undue influence. Sure. On them. Um, so he doesn't believe in giving a lot of praise. I, I do believe in giving a lot of praise. Um, but that's the difference between him and me. But at, at the same time, um, he could not possibly have been a, a fiercer defender of mm-hmm. me. Uh, I mean, it's, I was on probation every year and he had to fight for me every year to keep me enrolled at Princeton. Jeez. Wow. Well, Knowing so- what he knew is that those papers were mine. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, it's really good. I'm glad. It sounds like he was a really strong supporter. Um, and he was, and I wouldn't have a career if it weren't for Von Schwarzen to support. That's good to hear. Um, how was your time at uh, San Diego? Oh, it was great. I had some really good colleagues, and, and um, it was, it's a great department, and I felt supported and it was, it was really fun. So, what, so, okay, that's great. And so then, you know, when the Berkeley job came up, was this something that you had your eye on? Were you, you know, interested in, in moving forward or, you know, how did that come about? Well, well, um, just generally speaking, I had understood from, uh, my training that it was good to move in your fourth year. So I, my fourth year came up and I was looking around at what, where I could possibly move in my fourth year. So I applied to a couple of jobs and the early job um, came through. Um, hmm. And um, what was- I, I really only applied for two jobs and the Berkeley sure. job I, and I got the Berkeley job. So, so that was very nice. What was it about? Um, I mean, is this something that still exists in this kind of advice in terms of, 
it is you know, um, worthwhile to consider moving in your fourth year? Where do you think that, uh, where does that come from? Well, I, I think that that's rather old fashioned advice. Um, I think that um, things don't exactly work the same way they used to. Mm-hmm. Okay. I guess I'm trying to find the the rationale behind is it to, to I guess further diversify your experience, um, you know, connect you well, with other research yeah. programs. Um, yeah, and to and to, to consolidate your tenure position, make sure that you go for tenure. Yeah, when you move and oh, stuff sure. like that. Sure, sure. Okay, okay, okay. So. Once you made it to Berkeley, you were there for quite a while. Is that right? Yeah, I was there for nine years. And I started off in a, as an assistant professor, and I left as the full professor. So I went all the way up the hierarchy there. Fantastic. Uh, okay. And uh, how was your time at Berkeley? Well, it was mixed, I would say. Yeah. I had fabulous colleagues and some not so fabulous colleagues. I mean, there are people there who think that philosophy of science isn't real philosophy. Mm. And um, that's not, that's an open secret. I'm not telling you. Anything no, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, so that makes it hard for a philosopher of science to be in that department. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are some of the reasons why folks would say philosophy of science, like folk, maybe folks in the, the department there, would consider it to be not real philosophy? Well, you really have to ask them. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. because, no, seriously, because I don't fully understand it. Uh, gotcha. I mean, it's a view that's related to thinking that they're w- w- what they call, th- these are folks that say things like the philosophical, it's not related to the philosophical question. Mm. They, they talk like that. It, whereas the philosophical question is the question of skepticism. Hmm. So, so these are folks who talk like that, and and you know you're not going to make any headway. Look, philosophers of science, frankly speaking, don't think that the don't spend time worrying about the problem of skepticism. Right? We don't. Philosophers of science are more interested in the creation of knowledge than worrying about the foundations of knowledge per se, or securing sure. the possibility of knowledge. We're, right. we're more worried about how knowledge gets made than we are worried about securing the possibility of knowledge, right? Right, right. And that's, that's an insurmountable or uncrossable gulf between philosophers of science and this particular breed of skeptical inquiry yeah. um, um, and philosophical inquiry that's focused on skepticism. If you're interested in establishing or discussing the possibility of knowledge, you're not going to be very happy with people who assume that knowledge is possible and want to explore all the ways that it is established. Sure. Which is what philosophers of science do, yeah. and and so that that is the philosophical gulf between the two parties. And um, given that situation, I think the appropriate professional stance to take is to uh, is to w- withhold comment. In other words. Mm to say we have different philosophical approaches. We think different philosophical questions are important, full stop. I I think that the appropriate professional response is not to say that person over there doesn't have a reasonable philosophical program. Right. And I would never do that, and I never did do that. Yeah, but it sounds like you felt, though, that was certainly going on. toward the philosophy of science. In fact. Yeah. 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 I mean, it sounds to me like there's just a different focus. Um, but I suppose if you, you know, feel like you need, you know, uncomfortable lumping the two together or and you need to split these things. Um, yeah. It just, uh, 
Yeah, I, I would like to ask some more folks. I mean, I, I typically only have philosophers of science on the podcast. Um, I have some more analytically inclined philosophers who might have had more formal training in you know, what you might consider a more traditional philosophy who you know, still have this kind of, we need to get make philosophy of science a little bit more concerned with general philosophical problems or, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting to talk to maybe some uh, actual analytical philosophers to ask them, okay, what is, what do you can see is the, the big difference here? Um, yeah, I, I actually think being bogged down in methodological disputes with analytic M and E is a dead end. And <laughs> yeah, it's, maybe it's not that interesting. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's no, no. I mean, that's my personal, I, I mean, f- from my personal point uh-huh. of view, um, I, 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 I am not taking that approach. Sure. Um, I think it's good that more philosophers of science are interested in making an impact in the sciences today. That was always my orientation. Right. I was always operating in the realm of scientific practice and methods and trying to think of ways that philosophy could contribute to scientific methodology and practice. Um, so, you know, I, I don't take the approach that philosophy should just observe science or write about it, like some philosophers of biology think. Right. Um, uh, w- w- there are lots of open questions that philosophers could contribute to in mm-hmm. in the sciences. Um, and um, I think that people who worry that that's too close to the science are really not paying attention. Um, the question, it was very common in the UC Berkeley department to mm-hmm. a favorite question to ask on, for example, job interviews and so on was to say, that's all very interesting, but is it philosophy? <laughs> uh, um, how would, yeah. And, and how would you respond to that? I mean, <laughs> or how would, uh, I guess maybe you were one of the folks asking that question. Um, uh, uh, no, I. that's a question I would never, ever ask, and I would never yep. answer such a question. So, I would never I would never answer such a question. I think right. it's, it's not, not a useful question. Yeah. So I know, uh, you know, uh, but from being, from, from myself, for example, being a graduate student and being aware of a lot of philosophers of science, a lot of most us philosophers of science are looking at jobs that are placed in uh, many philosophy departments. We're kind of expecting that question. And um, maybe, you know, and uh, I mean, obviously, yeah, it's a give a, not looking to give a, you know, non answer, but um, yeah, I mean, I think about it in terms of, uh, I agree with you that the kind of the feel of needing to, I don't know, justify your, your program in some kind of a way, but um, there are some pragmatic concerns at times with, with doing so. No, it's fair. I mean, you, look, if, if you're a young philosopher of science, uh, finishing your degree, for example, and you don't have a job, you're going on the job market, you're being interviewed by philosophy departments that don't have a philosopher of science. They're looking to get their own philosopher of science. You're going to have to fit in with a bunch of philosophers who want to know how you're going to fit in as a philosopher. And they want to know, can they talk to you? And yeah. the way to talk to philosophers is to talk philosophy with them. So you should be able to talk philosophy with them. I'm not saying don't learn philosophy. Of course, of course. Yeah. Um and eat. Um, about sure. about trying to fit in with analytic and and oh, um, I think we might be losing you. Hold on one moment. Lisa? Yeah, are you there? Okay, sorry. I think yeah, we cut out for a little bit. It's been a little, little, bit, but I think I think we're there. Okay. Um. Okay. So yeah. So uh, you know, this uh, at this time, um, you were at Berkeley for around nine years. You said correct. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. And um, did you have any you know favorite projects that you w- worked on at that time? Favorite projects that I worked on at that time? Yes. I one of the things that I did at Berkeley was uh, and in the solution, um, I I formulated in nineteen eighty nine an analysis of the units of selection phase, which were at the time consuming not just philosophers of biology, it was the top question in philosophy of biology, but also one of the top questions in evolutionary theory. Um, Not just about group selection, but about genic selection and species selection and so on. Um, it, It took me seven years to figure this out, but I thought I had finally figured out what the chief problem was with most approaches to the units and levels of selection problems. And and the problem was that the mm. participants were asking different questions and had different goals in mind when they asked. So what I did was divide up the questions up into not just the but also categories, the beneficiaries, that is, in the long run, the process, but the question that we're talking to is to answer the, the replicator or the gene and the manifestor of adaptation. In other words, what who has the what level of entity or what unit of selection has the adaptation and manifests the adaptation. And that was a big deal in the species selection debate because Gould and Verba had said you had to manifest an adaptation at the engineering adaptation at the species level in order for species selection to go on, but that's not right. You can have selection without adaptation showing. Um, you can have a selection process without an engineering adaptation. You do it on the individual level. Why do you require it at the species level? So I picked an picked a fight with Steve Gould about that for about four years and finally turned him around. And so we published a joint paper on species selection um, in 1993 when I was at Berkeley. Um, uh, And he changed his whole position around um, to uh, join me in my analysis, which was nice. And um, and in 2001, uh, finally, I published my 1989, um, well, 1992, I guess, was my first publication of my four questions analysis of the units of selection. In 2001, I published the full analysis, which was endorsed by virtually every major player in the debate, including George Williams, John Maynard Smith, Bill Hamilton um, of the genic selectionists, and also uh, Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Lewinson, Feldman of the group selectionists. And wow. Mike Wade of the group selection. So everybody endorsed this um, analysis except for uh, Richard Dawkins, um, <laughs> who, ha- who, who hadn't read it. Oh, no. Um, so, um, so this analysis was endorsed, and it was later selected to appear in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as um, the entry on units of selection. A version of it was later appeared, and it still appears. I've I've expanded it and expanded it and altered it and revised it like three times since then, mm-hmm. but it's still in the Stanford Encyclopedia. So I'd say that was probably the peak. Oh, I bet. Yeah. How was that? It sounds like this was. Was this? I mean, would you say was this one of your? You, you've had several other publications, I imagine, but was this kind of like your first big project that really took the field uh, by storm? Um, so to speak, or I, I'd say it was the second. The okay. first was when I published my book on models, mm. um, because well, when I published my paper on models and then my book on models, um, where I insisted that we had to approach biological theories and biological subjects in terms of models and not in terms of axiomatized sets. Now, by the time I published my book in 1988 and 1986, my papers in 1988, 
in, and argue that we had to think in terms of models by the time 1992-93 rolled around and we had the first uh, international study, uh, international group on the history, philosophy, and social studies of biology, um, meaning um, everybody was thinking in terms of models. So huh. my, my project was very successful there. Um, they don't cite me, but, but the project itself was very uh, successful. Um, so I'd say that first, and it was a finalist for the Lakatosh Prize, um, that book. Oh, um, so I'd say that would be the that would be the first impact. But but I did that when I was at San Diego. What I did at Berkeley was the units analysis. Oh, okay. Um, and that, that analysis and the other big analysis I did at Berkeley was the one on objectivity. And mm. and, and in that analysis, only a fraction of which is actually published. I've got it. I've got basically the major part of a book in a drawer. Oh wow. <laughs> um, the, that's never been published, um, my analysis of objectivity. And um, a little fraction of it is published in a paper in 1995, a project on objectivity, where I analyzed out five different meanings of objective and objectivity, um, being, being unbiased, detached, public, independently existing, and really real. Mm-hmm. That these are all distinct meanings, and they all mean that the, all of those things mean objective or object uh, or refer to objectivity, mm-hmm. but they're all quite distinct meanings, as I outlined in the paper. And I extracted them from the literature in analytic philosophy. And what I found in the literature in analytic philosophy, especially moral philosophy and analytic philosophy of mind, was that these uh, different five different meanings were being uh, equivocated upon in the literature, thus getting you leapfrogged from one meaning to the other in order to sustain the argument. Mm. Um, so um, it, it's quite handy if you go from being showing that something is detached or public to arguing that it's really real or arguing that it's independently existing when what you've shown is that it's public. Um, that, that, that's quite a feat. Mm. Um, and, and it's not necessarily so, right? So um, we do often make these three methodological meanings of objective, public, unbiased, and detached those are the signs of something that's independently existing or really real. And I separate those two because you can have dreams that are really real, but not independently existing. That's why I separate those two for subjectively exist, really real existing thing. Right. Um, <clears throat> and, and you can have those methodological versions of objective that you want to use to infer these metaphysical uh, meanings. And, just in 2014, I published a paper with a climate scientist adding two more meanings of objective. One is um, a kind of procedural objectivity, meaning you follow the same rules in order to get the same results. And another one is the kind of interactive objectivity that Longino um, outlines, where you have a community following certain procedures that and um, inter- standards following objective standards that get, gives you through its interaction objective results. Um, so those are two more meanings of objective that I've outlined in my publish publications. Wow. Um, and that that paper was cited by the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change UN report. Right. So. So this has been, uh, 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 I might as well ask, so you have been, you know, one of the philosophers of science who I've admired has been very successful at, at really integrating themselves within the scientific community, making an impact, getting cited by, you know, these, you know, um, regulatory agencies when they're putting together these formal reports, basically, basically just really involved. Um, uh, you know, what, what is, uh, what is your strategy for doing so? Uh, you know, how do you, uh, how do you approach the, how do you approach doing your work such that it, it can have a, such an impact on the science? Well, I go, uh, 
what what I do um, requires a deep understanding of both the science and the philosophy. And I talk with scientists and I read their work and I write about their practice and I write about how their practice could be improved and how we should understand this science both structurally and methodologically, right? right. So, so my philosophy has always been based on scientific practice, whether it's theorizing or experimental or field work. So, um, uh, uh, I, I, well, I think in terms of an example, um, so I, I published a book on female orgasm. Yeah, orgasm but why don't we talk about that a bit, about some of your work with the female orgasm, yeah. And, and I pointed out that, among other things, I, I pointed to a number of open questions in sexology that had never been ex- properly explored. I, I I detailed a number of questions about female orgasm that we needed to know but didn't know because no one had ever done the research. And um, I did that on my way to uh, exploring the various theories of female orgasm, the evolution of female orgasm. But in, in the chapter on, on orgasm research, I said, look, there's so much that we don't know. For example, this, 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 and this. And... <clears throat> People read that book who were young researchers and said, I'm going to find this out. Hmm. So, so some postdocs oh, did some groundbreaking work, finding an answer to a very important but previously unanswered question about the genetic fitness value of female orgasm, for example. Because I said nobody knows whether nobody's ever actually studied whether orgasm is correlated with the number of children that you have. We don't know the answer to that question, and so they studied that and they found that genetic fitness value of female orgasm is zero. Hmm. This is a major discovery. It's very significant for our understanding of human evolution, and it wouldn't exist if it were not for my book, huh. because. Because I'm because I asked the question, I put the question out there. Somebody read the book, they did the research, and they answered the question. Right. 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 So, so you know, the basically, I think there are two standards of success in philosophy. One one is dealing with deep questions in which we don't ever get a clear answer, but we wrestle with a deep problem. Um, that's like the folks I was talking about before. This right. school ends up being dismissive of anything that's capable of coming to a decisive conclusion. So real philosophy has no real answers. But the other standard in philosophy is a kind of forehead slapping. So you are, and this is what I do. So you write about a phenomenon, a theory, an analysis, or an approach that is so obvious that it's amazing that no one has said it, hasn't said it before. <laughs> so this would be like my work on units of selection. It's a sudden insight that's like a gestalt experience where the world is reordered in a certain way, where things that were murky suddenly make sense. And, and, and the same thing happened with my logic of research questions work, which repeatedly evoked this forehead slapping response. That's so obvious. Why didn't I think of that? People repeatedly have said that about <laughs> my logic of research questions work. Um, so this latter mark of success in philosophy, the forehead slapping, is also associated with ideas that are useful to working scientists. Um, And so I identify with that tradition. But it's sometimes thought in philosophy that this means that the problem was never truly philosophical. Mm. Because it's not not more challenging enough because it seems to, you know, how how could we have come to such a clear-cut solution if the problem wasn't rigorous, you know, if the premises weren't uh, inconsistent enough with one another or something. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah, but th- this is wrong. This is wrong. I mean, just the fact that it took me 30 years to come up with the logic of research questions, or it took me seven years to come up with units of selection after spending right. all the seven years on the problem, right? But, but and, and it looks, you make it look so easy and obvious mm-hmm. that it looks like the problem was never truly philosophical. So, um, I, I think that's a, 
I think that's a, a concern. Yeah, um, absolutely. When, when you, you work with the scientists. But, but I think that if you do the kind of philosophy that I try to do and you do it, you do it well, then both philosophers of science and scientists will can share in that forehead slapping experience <laughs> where they just go, why didn't you think of this? This is so obvious. And so that's true for my objectivity work. That's true for the units of selection work. That works for the adaptationism and logic of research questions work. Oh, and wait, I, I should say something about about what the logic of research Yeah, I was going to maybe, yeah, follow up. With, what, yeah, what is this idea? Well, um, the, um, the logic of research questions um, work um uh really um really is about adaptationism and methodological adaptationism so um methodological adaptationism is the research program uh where um you get um the question what is the function of this trait you go out as a biologist and you ask what is the function of this trait? And there's been a lot of important discoveries using this question. Um, what is the function of this trait? And so it, that's what methodological adaptations do. Usually animal behaviorists ask mm -hmm. what's the function of this trait. Um, I want to contrast that research question with a different research question. Does this trait have a function? Or what evolutionary factors contribute to the form and distribution of this trait? Now, these two types of questions have totally different answers that are responsive to them or possible given them. If the question is, what is the function of this trait? The responsive answer has to be the function is X or the function is Y, the function of the trait is Z. It has to look like that, a responsive answer. But if you ask the other question, does this trait have a function or what evolutionary factors contribute to the form and distribution of this trait? The answer could be, this trait has a function X, this trait has a function Y, or it could be this trait is a genetically correlated trait or a byproduct or an acceptation or a phyletic holdover or some combination of those answers. So you get a totally different answer set with the second question that you do for the first question. And that is a, that is a nutshell, in a nutshell, what the problem is with methodological adaptationism because any different answer from a function answer is non-responsive to the question and appears to be logically the mm -hmm. wrong answer. Yeah. So that's, why they, that's why they cannot accept byproduct as a legitimate answer. And they mm -hmm. don't. They're on record never accepting byproduct as a legitimate answer, except with one tiny exception in the case of male nipples. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> of course. Of course. So, so it's so obvious when I say it like that, right? It's so obvious yeah. when I contrast the function of this trait and does this trait have a function, right? It's forehead slapping, right? But it yeah. takes some forethought to really get down. Well, it takes study in the science to think about, to, to, to be descriptive, to have more of a naturalistic approach to understanding what, what questions are they actually asking. And then you kind of have to think further about it. Um, well, so it took me 30 years to come up with that after yeah, thinking exactly. about the problem of adaptation. It's frankly, it took me 30 years. But what I, what I think I'm doing with this is furthering a critique Mm -hmm. Not about evaluating evidence, but about evaluating the science as a whole. Mm. Not just about, I'm not just critiquing the evidence of the adaptationist, which is the approach that Gould and Lewinton took, about critiquing the kinds of answers and evidence that they gave. This is about critiquing the questions. Gotcha. Very nice, very nice. Okay, well, that's really that's really good to good to learn about uh, this particular paper that I had just actually come about. Um, so, 
you know, so now why don't we, um, we've been going for a little bit. Maybe we can go for a few more minutes longer. Um, so I know you've made it to Indiana for the past, uh, you said 20 years or so. Yeah. That's great. How has your, how's been your time here? Oh, fabulous. I love Indiana's department and, um, it's, it's just been really fantastic to be here. Um, I've gotten just tons of work done with a lot of support from the Indiana uh, department and, um, it, it's been pretty great to work with all the graduate students here. And, um, I've had some wonderful students working with me and I really enjoy the atmosphere here. So it's been pretty great. I've, I started a new field of study, mm-hmm. uh, philosophy of climate science. And I have my first book coming out um, in it um, in just a matter of weeks, um, oh. the new edited collection on climate models and their philosophical and conceptual issues is coming out. Um, it's the first one on climate models from a philosophical perspective, and I'm hoping it can serve as a kind of text for interested people. Absolutely. Um, um, maybe could you share what, you know, what are some of your, you know, major questions, um, and interest related to uh, philosophy of climate science? Well, uh, right now I'm working on um, extreme event attribution methods, which, which means um, uh, methods, uh, to, to, when you have an extreme event, you can analyze it and try to figure out how, to what degree that extreme event was due to climate change. And that's called attribution, extreme event attribution. And I've been working on this field for several years now, about three years now. And I'm writing, I've written a paper with Naomi Oreski. And um, we just had a paper also published with Michael Mann, the leading climate scientist, Michael Mann, the guy who invented the hockey stick graph. Right. (laughs) Um, he he became interested in my work on this topic, and we've just published a jointly co-authored paper in climatic change um, in September, discussing a Bayesian approach to climate attribution, this subject. And so um, I've also got a paper with Naomi Reskes, um, and we're working on it um, for Earth's future. Um, and um, it's... I went to England, um, Exeter and Oxford, and I went to Boulder to talk to scientists involved in the debate. And it's about the methods that are used uh, to do this attribution. And some of them involve risks of uh, over-attribution, attributing climate science when there, climate change when it isn't so. And some of them, involves risks of under attribution and the dangers it produces like under preparation for disastrous weather, which may be much more profound for society. And we're arguing that this error of under attribution, um, the type two error, in other words, that the, it, that the, uh, the, the method produces mm-hmm. is actually quite dangerous for society. And this needs to be discussed by the climate scientists before they um, decide which methodology to use. Um, So we've been, they've been having a fight, a quite flagrant and abusive fight about these areas. So we've been urging a deflationary and careful conversation between the relevant parties so that um, either methodology in the fight could be used depending on the situation, or in some case, both methodologies could be used complementing each other's weaknesses. It, it's been done in at least one case under contention, so so that's good. And we're trying to ease the situation into a more cooperative picture. Great. So when you say that you're trying to sort of use your work to ease, you know, so what does this what does this involve? Like, are you who who are you talking with, and you know, what kinds of uh, meetings are you having? Well, I'm talking with the people at the center of the debate. The, the people who are actually writing the papers that um, are in the fight. And I'm, so I'm going right to the horse's mouth and talking mm-hmm. to the, pap- the authors of the papers who, who are the main contenders. And I'm talking with them and asking them, what do you have against the other view? Why are you so adamant about the other view? 
and I meet with them, I talk with them, I talk with them for hours and hours, and, and I get a sense of wh- where they're coming from, and I try to introduce a more harmless point of view, mm-hmm. and that's what we're doing in our paper, is trying to introduce a more harmless and more cooperative point of view between the parties and urge that they proceed in a less hostile manner. Um, and it, the, the, the publication, um, we have to do some revisions on it, but it would appear uh, if it gets accepted with the revisions in Earth's Future, which is a major um, climate journal, um, read um, by the AGU, run by the AGU, which is the American Geophysical Union, the main um, place where climate scientists um, read. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, so that's where it would, would come out. So we're trying to speak to the climate scientists. This is not a paper specifically for philosophers. It's a paper for climate scientists sure. about climate scientists, sure. about de-escalating their debate. Right. Right. So I think it's, yeah, it's important in, in going forward with certain the work to certainly consider the audience with which you're writing. Uh, in this instance, it's very much the, the scientists themselves. Yes. And so, you know, sometimes I write for a philosophical audience. Course, sometimes yeah. I write for a scientist audience. Um, for example, sometimes I write for a mixed audience. We just have a paper coming out next week in biological theory that's a co-authored mm-hmm. paper about holobionts. Uh, a holobiont is just a host organism and all of the cooties, all of the microbes mm-hmm. that live with the host in its gut and on its skin and, and mouth and everything. And um, so you have the host and all the all the microbes called the holobiont. And um, it's about holobiont evolution. Mm. And we, um, we apply my... Um, we apply. I was invited uh, by the m- microbiologists to apply my analysis of units of selection to the holobiont. And Mike Wade pointed out to me that it was nice that my analysis of holobiont uh, of units of selection could be applied to a whole new realm of holobiont, even though it wasn't uh, designed to do so. Uh, and so that's really nice. Mm. Right? I thought that I thought that was neat that he said that. But um, anyway, um, the whole, I'm writing a paper now also with on holobiont genetics with Mike Wade and uh, the new dynamics of symbiotic relationships and mutualisms that have you know consequences for gene centered theory and their worries about cheaters and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, this new paper with the microbiologists and the developmental biologists is coming out in biological theory, which is read by philosophers Number. and by biologists. So that's a kind of joint for philosophers and for biologists. Fantastic. So I write for yeah. different different audiences depending on the paper. And the logical research questions paper was for philosophers. Right. But uh. um but it's being expanded into a book on mm-hmm. adaptation for Michael Roos's and Grant Ramsey's series of elements for Cambridge University Press. It's a book on adaptation. It'll become a book It'll on be. adaptation. Okay, good, good, good. Well, fantastic. Um, well, let's, uh, let me conclude our, our chat, uh, which has been very nice, I must say, with uh, the last question I typically ask guests, uh, which is, um, what do you consider to be uh, the greatest challenge uh, facing philosophers of science today? The greatest challenge. <laughs> oh dear. Or a challenge. <laughs> well, I, I I think not getting bogged down in Disputes with metaphysicians is a big challenge. Mm. Um, I, I think that sticking to scientific, I think that writing about scientific practice and 
science itself, both structurally and methodologically. Um, that's what my work has always been about. I, I guess I, I think I see that as philosophy of science. This is science's big mm-hmm. challenge. So how can we contribute to understanding, for example, the new genetics of the whole genome biology? Or sure, how, sure. how can we help understand extinction? How can we help understand climate science and its scientific, social, and policy implications? I mean, philosophy of climate science is wide open to new work on a variety of issues. Um, I mean, for example, I've just proposed working on big data and philosophy of climate science for the National Science Foundation, and there's plenty of work to do on that front. So, you, you know, there there's all kinds of topics that philosophers of science have not delved into, I would say, that would be philosophies of science big challenges. Mm. Uh, uh, but you can't explore that if you're busy covering your hindquarters with some metaphysician. Yeah. So maybe do you have a, is there like a kind of a ba- basic example of where, you know, you've seen an area in philosophy and philosophy of science related where folks are getting bogged down in disputes? Like, is there a particular topic that you've seen and, or uh, uh, an example? You can well, I, I don't, I don't want to. Sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> but, I, think, I don't want to. I pick on anybody. I I I don't. I don't want to pick on anybody. No. Yeah. Yeah. Or I mean, maybe in, not in a way of this. You know, individual or something like that. But just like debates concerning X or something like that are tend to revolve around. And I, I mean, I hear this a lot. Let's say in cognitive science, a lot of people are discussing um, necessary and sufficient conditions for what is cognition, and uh, you know, there's. Some folks are really, really spending a lot of time deciding on what cognition really is, and then others are saying it's or or trying to let's say draw a line and demarcate. Okay, these you know these particular species have cognition; these don't. Um, and then you know others are like, well, I don't really care that much about this question. Let's you know further along. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Well, you know, take the for for example, take the the study of science and values. I mm-hmm. think that I think that trying to establish the legitimacy legitimacy of science despite the fact that values permeate science and values of all types mm-hmm. permeate permeate scientific investigation. Um we we should not be um defensive about the fact that science is permeated by all kinds of values. Mm. Um, uh, for example, um, there is a kind of value-free ideal that's imported from analytic M&E um, that I think should be just discarded at the door. Gotcha. Okay. So that would be an, that would be an okay. Example. Yeah, I think that's an yeah yeah absolutely. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. I do. Okay. All right. Well, Lisa, Dr. Elizabeth Lloyd, thank you so much for for sharing a, a great deal of your origin story and uh, uh, some very clear, lucid thoughts about your work and and how to do really good philosophy of science. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share or uh, you know uh, discuss or plug uh, anything new work or uh, announcements or anything? I I have some general advice to share. Which I'd is, love to hear it. Uh, yeah. Which, for everybody, which, which is that if you're a young student or a young professor, um, don't pay that much attention to people who are discouraging to you. Listen to people who are encouraging you or criticizing you in a constructive manner. Um, I, I always take criticism seriously, but um, the it's very important to listen to people and take them the most seriously who are trying to advance you and move you ahead and who reinforce you and, and endorse your work. Um, if I had listened to everybody who put me down and dismissed my work and said I wasn't qualified, I would have never gotten out of my first week of graduate school. Mm. And, um, you just can't listen to people who who put you down. You need to pay attention to people who endorse you and your work and who are positive influences on you. That's the most important thing to do in your life. And so I really strongly 
strongly urge you to take that principle to heart. Okay. Well, that's uh, those are some wonderful words, and uh, I really appreciate the thought. And uh, thank you so much, Leanne and Lisa, for taking the time. And uh, uh, yeah, have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. You too, Nick. All right. Bye-bye.